The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. The sounds of the shaking fence would be heard by no one. Hansen knew that. Yet they unnerved him just as surely as the crunch of dry leaves underfoot might unsettle a man making his lone way through a graveyard in the dead of night. His heart pounded. Sweat seemed to run out of every pore. His arms and legs trembled. Climbing the fence was easy. Being here was not. So Begins One Rainy Night by Richard Lehman This episode on... Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. And welcome to the seventh episode here of Dread Dialectic. This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Skix Medics. And of course, today we're going to be talking about the perennial Richard Lehman classic, One Rainy Night. Uh, one of the few that I believe was originally published through Leisure here in the U.S. Uh, they did some reprints later, and maybe this was one of them, but I think this is one of the originals. The reason that I suggested this was because uh, if you are watching our OMG playthrough of... Deadly Premonition, the reveal of kind of what's going on in that story made me think about this one, and so I thought uh, there was harmony between the two. Uh, before we get into anything else, though, let's go ahead and give a basic plot synopsis. Skix, you want to give us that? Quite simply, small town, suddenly starts raining black liquid, everyone touched by the black liquid becomes murderous. Hijinks and Sue. Hijinks and Sue, and a lot of rape. Trigger warning. <laughs> Ridiculous amount of rape. And speaking of, uh, let's talk about trigger warnings. Trigger warnings. Boy, is there rape. Uh, and rapey thoughts. Sometimes associated with corpses and children. Yeah. So, like, if, if that, that further degree uh, is an issue. Kirkus Reviews called Richard Lehman, quote, the stomach-churning master of porno violence, unquote. And I think that's pretty much on display here. Um... Sure. Also, racism is is prevalent both from certain characters and, I believe, from the author. Someone could argue that, but I think they'd be wrong. <laughs> I think it's definitely not as, say, mean-intentioned as Lair of the White Worm, but it's well, definitely uh, there. Yeah. Uh, we, are at, we are at least in microaggression <laughs> territory, if nothing else. What's between micro and macro? There's, there's got to be a mid midi. It's in the in between, I would say. Um, just a just crow aggressions. We have three sections: the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes. Good. We're going to talk about what we liked about the book. Mm -hmm. Bad. We're going to talk about what we didn't like. And the ugly is where we're going to go into spoilers, and we're going to talk about the quote unquote the monster at the end of the book, uh, i.e. Uh, if we were doing it, we're going to talk about, oh, it's a giant spider from outside of time and space, or Spoiler. it's not really a giant spider, but anyway. I, you know, it's, like I said, we're not going to cover Stephen King on this podcast, so we're going to spoil the shit out of Stephen King. <laughs> Pet Cemetery. Everybody dies, but they get brought back. Uh, <laughs> For sequels in the movie. Before we get into that, however, I would like to remind everyone that uh, feedback, comments, suggestions for what to read, uh, suggestions for how to live our lives, and <laughs> if you have manuscripts that you would like to share with us, as long as they're not short stories or poetry, because they don't really lend themselves well to review, or really feel expensive. free to shoot that on over to dread.dialectic at gmail.com. But for now, let's go ahead and talk some more about One Rainy Night. Uh, the good, I'm going to go ahead and start here, Do it. because, full disclosure, so Richard Lehman I discovered, I believe, early on in college, uh, which would be somewhere around 95, 96. I, I, I know it was when I saw Bite on the stands, and Lehman was prolific. Like, if you, even if you hate him, you have to give him that. He was prolific as hell, uh, so it's tough to narrow down that time, but I, I was big into the Leisure Horror Books imprint, and Bite was, I believe, the first original that he did for them. And the plot synopsis didn't really sound good, but I really liked the cover design, and I eventually broke down and bought it, and really enjoyed it. Bite is one of his later stories, which is not so much like this one, though it still has a lot of the same sort of themes. I would say probably a good 80% of his books are really similar to One Rainy Night in the way that they handle 
sex and race and yada, 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 yada. The reason that I'm saying all of this is it's like I feel like I shouldn't enjoy this as much as I do, yet I still just love uh, Lehman's writing style. It's a very particular sort of writing style. And I want to get into that more later, but I'm curious. I know that you had many issues with this, Skix, <laughs> but I'm curious, just the, the writing itself. What, what did you think of that? I mean, it's a it's easy as hell to read, right? It is, and in fact, while I was reading it on the Kindle, I highlighted the, the opening sentences, which I believe you all heard before the opening. This is pretty goddamn crazy, Hanson thought, but he didn't climb down. And it, it's not elegant. It's not detailed, but it's interesting. It sort of gets the ball rolling right away. And I liked that. I liked that a lot. If you sort of carve out the parts that I think are shit <laughs> and and get like the 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 extremely short story that remains, yeah, I, I, I could find him being a real enjoyable writer. He just needs to fix his relationship with women, homosexuals, black people, <laughs> his mother. I really don't know how I fall on this. Like this one is kind of uh, especially brutal, indefensible, if you will. But one of the reasons why I enjoyed a lot of his stuff so much when I was younger is that I think he really well, and, and like I say, it's not, it's not so much in this book, but I think you can, having read this, you can probably easily imagine it. I think that he really brilliantly shows the inner workings of the mind of a quote-unquote nice guy and shows the kind of seething anger and resentment that's right underneath the surface. And I feel as if, A, he almost certainly enjoyed writing this stuff, but B, he also was at times kind of satirizing, using the overdose drenched sex and violence as a commentary on, I don't know, yes. American society in general. Well, you're giving him more credit than I do, but uh, I can see... I can see the possibility that he might have been more self-aware than I think he was. I also think that that changed as he matured as a writer. My favorite book of his that I read is The Midnight Tour, which is nearly 600 pages long, and there is no violence or sexual violence until like the last 35 pages. It's all a build-up to the, to the climax, and it is basically just character study up to that point, and... I think he just, he does that really well. You know, I was saying, we were talking about this, and I said, uh, you, you were kind of saying how the characters seem very, I don't know, two-dimensional, unbelievable, something along those lines, right? I, I say he writes like an alien, <laughs> trying to understand human beings. And I said that there's only one character who ever, like, I ever remembered out of the probably dozen-plus books of his that I've read, and that was Owen from uh, Midnight Tour. He is like that prototypical nice guy and seeing the kind of anger and rage that's just right under the surface and uh come out tonight dealt with that a lot as well as did island and yada 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 anyway and and there's a little bit of this our uh, this, this is really an ensemble piece, but our uh, basically main character, our hero character who's in charge of like getting rid of the, the thing that's going on here, which we'll talk about in the ugly. But here's a quote from him. He's essentially, he's got two goals throughout this book, and that's one, stop whatever's causing the rain, if he can, and two, find this girl he likes, Maureen. Make sure she's safe. So there's this point where he's rescued another woman uh, who was hiding in Maureen's house, because he goes to Maureen's house. And here's a quote from Trevor's point of view. He felt a strange mixture of desire and sadness. That was Maureen's coat, but not Maureen's leg. Not Maureen's groin, just out of sight under the draping fabric. He loves the word groin. <laughs> well, you can see why Maureen is so important to him, right? It's, uh... Because she has a groin? <laughs> <laughs> right and and legs it's At just it's, you know he's not like oh but maureen's laughter wasn't there or anything like that it's it's that groin man <laughs> that groin uh that character uh the the woman she's like really the only woman that had any interesting dialogue is also the only one with any dialect I and mean, i thought she was black for a long time because she had a very ebonic southern sort of dialect but because white is default in this world and everyone is covered in black goo 
it's a little hard to tell from his writing whether someone is actually black or not. And it turns out that almost no one is black. Right. But I thought she was black for a long time until he, like, contrasted her skin against the black rain or some bullshit. I, I, I wasn't terribly surprised, because it's mostly two guys surrounded by white women being attacked on all sides. Did you notice that kind of, there, like, every storyline, because we follow a bunch of different characters in a bunch of different situations, and almost all of them turned into their own little harem comedies, basically. Yes. With the exception of the r racist rapists who had, at least at the start, they started with three and two, so, but the women did eventually out outnumber them as they went on. Yeah, three harems, actually. Three harems and the rapists. <laughs> We got ourselves a Broadway musical title, <laughs> goddammit. <laughs> Three harems and the rapists. And the women in the rapist gang pissed me off because they were like, oh, that's gross, I don't want to see that, not, don't rape her. <laughs> <laughs> they saw her as competition, which is what a man would write. I That and, and, and later when, when Maureen is uh, in the rain and she remembers the rape and starts getting hot about it. It's like, oh, Jesus Christ. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. This on, on the first point there, this book is one of the few things to ever make a negative score on the Bechtel test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but again, I want to believe, and I again, I could be giving him too much credit. I don't know. But, like, for instance, he wrote a nonfiction book about writing and kind of about surviving as a B-list writer. And it was pretty reflective and intelligent and so on and so forth so i don't think it's a crazy possibility to give him too much credit but that to me seemed an almost verhovian comment upon the vapid sort of surface bullshit of society the way that the women were just like oh i, w I bet you wish you were in there raping her instead of buddy <laughs> yes <laughs> and you know what that's some of the most interesting character and dialogue in the book is that that bullshit right there you mm -hmm. know just just because there was a conversation happening and then there was something at stake in the conversation and and it wasn't just a manly man gritting his teeth and looking at the hordes out against him and and protecting his women's <laughs> and all that and dressed in trash bags funnily enough which i think would be funny and if if they ever did make a movie about it but they never would it, it is it is a pretty visual story, I think, overall. Yeah. So, yeah, I thought it was really easy to read. I think there's possibly a lot of social commentary going on. Not so much in this one, but just in layman in general. I read this not knowing anything about it. I, I didn't even, like, process what the name of the book was. I didn't read the, the cover or anything like that, because that's how I like to read things when I have the opportunity to do so. So I didn't know where it was going. I didn't know anything about it. Never heard of the author. So the first scene leading up to the rain, I thought was brilliant. We've got this cop who's climbing over a fence uh, into the, the high school football field because a black kid had been lynched there and he didn't feel good about how, how the case had been handled. And some guy comes out, comes out of the shadow and, and he's, I don't know, the caretaker or, or janitor or something. And they start yeah. talking. So there's, there's thunder, it begins to rain and suddenly the caretaker appears black and the cop appears to think that the the caretaker was in disguise and the disguise was washing off and then he bit his neck <laughs> i think he shot him and then ripped his neck out or something like that so i thought a much better book was about to happen because <laughs> i thought the cop was a vampire <laughs> honestly i think that that first section that first chapter could almost stand alone as, as a as a cute little dark short story sure and it, and at that point the, the the concept of race is interesting and involved here i think we're gonna segue into the bad yeah. with that opening section i really thought oh man finally we're gonna read a book that's like anti-racist you know <laughs> that is that's actually even if it's kind of basic very ham-handed <laughs> don't lynch children yay <laughs> right even if it's that then at least it's 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 something less racist than you know more anti-racist than anything that we've been reading so far i mean excepting uh, lovecraft country but still there we had to talk about it the whole time i was really excited about that and then it's like oh wow uh some of it gonna leave till the ugly but <laughs> so one thing this isn't exactly racism but this is richard layman trying to write an english person poor blighter might go into cardiac arrest if i try to drag him off with me <laughs> 
And it's like that cadence is just so like layman, basic white middle America, but then he throws in blighter because he's like, I guess that's what English people sound like. That's right. I forgot there was another dialect. <laughs> and then the, the the crowning moment where I was like, oh, Dick, why? This is from page 227. He indicated an oriental wearing a chef's floppy cap and holding a meat cleaver, which the image is really nice, but not only is it an or oriental used to describe a human, but it's not even capitalized. An oriental. Later on, there's a Bible, and it's always the Bible capitalized and italics, like a title. <laughs> yeah. Which is technically okay in certain circumstances, but really weird in, in fiction. This was written in the early 90s, so it's been a while, but yeah, We still... already knew about Oriental in yeah, the 90s. Yeah, I, still, I think that's... Both he and his editor were obviously pretty damn sheltered to not know. <laughs> and look, if you're listening and you don't know what we're talking about, Oriental refers to things and objects from Asia, not people. Right. Just to be clear, if you're listening and you don't realize that, it's okay, but now you know. Into bad, well, I mean, there's that. But uh, every time a man looks at a woman, he gets hot for her. He looks at her breasts and blushes and looks away, or he looks at her breasts and wants to grab it, or looks at her breasts and wants to eat it if he's possessed, or whatever you would call it, if he's wet, actually, is how they call it. If he's wet, if this man is wet, or this woman is wet, then someone will want to bite their breasts, their buttocks, or their groin. But most of the combat is related to butts, breasts, and groins. When a woman is fighting a man, she'll knee him in the groin, almost invariably. If someone's got a stabbing item, they're gonna stab him in the butt or the boob. But clearly, our author has a, a focus. He seems to think all physical uh, attacks are, are, are based around first and secondary uh, sexual characteristics. So that's disconcerting, and it's disconcerting when, for example, there's a, a, a kid, is referred to as a girl, but I think as a young teenager, and she's passed out and she's wet, and our hero, who's dressed in plastic bags so he can be out in the rain safely, picks her up to throw her in the trunk. And it specifically says, he reaches his hand under her skirt to grab her by the thigh to lift her. Like, why are you doing that, layman? <laughs> why? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I kind of know why, but stop it. <laughs> and, and then, I mean, there was the rape, and there's lots and lots of wanting to rape and wishing they could rape and kind of general rapiness. And to give an example of that here, this is Lou talking to Buddy about what they're gonna do with Maureen. So Lou says, so we leave them here and take Maureen with us? That's the idea. What do we do with Maureen? Anything we want. You're both aching for her. Lou moaned. You'll let us? Damn right. Then we'll dump her and drop in on Lisa. Take care of her. Kill her? Don't worry, man, I'll do it. Lou leaned back against the door frame and stared at Buddy. He's gonna let me have Maureen. <laughs> And they, and they actually literally moan. And I love how it's like, Buddy's just said, yes, we're going to kill another human being. And he like, he falls against the door frame and looks at him. I, I don't know if I just fell for it because I'm an idiot, but I think when you read that, you're supposed to think, oh, Lou's overcome by how horrible this is. But instead, he's going to let me at Maureen. Yes. Evidence suggests that the guy spent a lot of the time semi-erect. Uh, including, I, I don't know if you noticed, when the, the rapist guys get wet and they start fighting each other, it is implied that they are also aroused, but not, not directly stated. Although, did you catch the part where that guy's, like, hiding behind the trash bin and starts fighting Lou and goes for his mouth with his mouth? Right. And and Lou freaks the fuck out. Like, it's, it's like this all caps, like, Oh God, he's going to kiss me! No, Jesus! Well, that's where he talks about when he was wrestling with the other guys, he says, I, I should be aroused now, but I'm not. I was when I was wrestling with the guys, but now I'm not. Ew, this is gross. So maybe he secretly kind of wants to fuck the other guys in his group, but a stranger guy, that would be weird. Uh, I think Lehman is just trying to say that the violence that comes with the rain is always eroticized, hmm. which isn't stated and doesn't always happen. The, the yeah. rules for what happens when you get wet are not clear. Because, I mean, the first time, the very first time, uh, the guy kind of went mindless, is, is how it read to me. By the end, people are like, well, I want to kill you, but I won't, because we have to go over there. I think it's clearly driven by the plot. That's well, yeah. how mindless you are. But this leads into, I think, black. So it's it's black rain. 
the triggering incident is the murder of a black child. Again, the, the description shifts as the book goes. By the end of the book, they're referring to wet people as black. He's not black, or he's black. She's black, you better watch out for her, she's black. They're dangerous, they're black. Either Lamin is doing it on purpose, he thinks he's funny, or he is so clueless and tone deaf he doesn't realize what it sounds like what he's saying. I want to give him credit, but with the way that the end of the book goes, it's yeah. tough to. Yeah, the end of the book really does not cast a forgiving light on the rest of the book. We'll talk about that in a moment. Just one last, I, I think, just in case you aren't, dear listener, grasping how prevalent the erotic violence of this movie is, or of this book is, I want to read you this section as well. He saw a naked woman sprawled on the pavement, squirming and rubbing herself as if the rain had triggered a fit of erotic ecstasy. He saw a couple rutting on the hood of a car. The man was on top, and Trev couldn't be sure whether the woman jerking beneath him was alive or dead. Really, that you could just pick a random page and there's probably something like that in it. Yeah. I, looking through my highlights, I saw another line that, that I, I actually wanted to share. I mentioned the, the girl, he stuck his hand up the skirt to throw her in the trunk. Well, they get in a car wreck, and the trunk pops open, and the girl is awake, and she attacks him because she's wet. He is offended, just trying to be a nice guy, and she, and she goes for me. He felt angry and betrayed, but mostly he felt scared. And that, that's such a quote-unquote nice guy thing, like how he, how he feels betrayed that, that someone doesn't turn to him after he does a nice thing. It almost seems, and maybe it's just that Layman's men are, are more horrible than, than I generally think of them, but it seems like it's starting to get to some of the covered ones toward, toward the end. They're, they're just, maybe they're just shitty people, and, and I, 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 I'm, maybe I'm the sheltered one here. But it, it felt really stilted where where Lehman was writing I'm going to write a rapist I'm going to write a racist I'm going to write a child I'm going to write and, uh, and they're just so st uh, forced I think we can go ahead and skip to the ugly what do you say spoilers beware this reign was brought about by uh, I believe the grandfather yes of the lynched teen black boys casting a voodoo magic spell of revenge basically trev goes in and shoots a lot of black people <laughs> at the end that's like what our climax is and it's kind of anticlimactic i mean after all that build up first of all having the 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 baddie be a literal witch doctor mm -hmm. casting hoodoo is how they how they say it in the book not voodoo which uh, there's subtle differences but whatever and just essentially just walks into their house and shoots him in the head. And yeah. then it ends, mostly. I really expected that it would come down to a conversation, that he would essentially have to, like, talk him down from his revenge. And instead, it's just walk in, shoot him in the head. Okay, done. We didn't even know who the sacrificed girl was, and that seems like that could easily have been a significant person in the story. I really felt like I kind of wanted more of the grandfather's story? Yeah, he was, I mean, god damn it, a fucking witch doctor. I mean, there's so many different ways to explain this black raid, right? But we got, right. a, but it's a, it's a vengeance by a witch doctor, which is pretty heavy handed for, you know, even for any of the voodoo stories I've heard. That, that's taken out a whole town by turning them into murderers and rapists and it really feels like and i mean this is the thing you're talking about stuff like the sacrifice girl and i'm like i don't even know what you're talking about because i <laughs> i honestly just kind of skimmed through that because it was like okay layman really doesn't care about the how or the you know right the, this is not the focus of the book he wants to investigate the kind of you tear away the veneer of social niceties and you know this is like the lord of the flies times ten thousand, right right the actual ritual He's got this girl hanging upside down on the wall, like crucified, upside down. So this is not very voodoo, actually. This is this is more satanic. But he takes pages of the Bible, rips them out, rolls them into a blunt, sets them on fire, and then uses the flaming Bible blunt to burn the girl. And then rips out another page and on and on and on. That's the oh, ritual that Layman invented for this. It seemed like kind of a shitty revenge because, like, for instance, 
the girl who his grandson was dating gets murdered. In fact, the um, perpetrators of the murder, they did eventually die, but it was a near thing. They they could very easily have gotten away with it. They they get to rape and uh, pillage for most of the book. Right, and they, they, were, they were mostly not wet, but still pretty horrible. And then they got wet and really weren't changed very much. Which I think that I, was an intentional <laughs> statement there. I love that scene where I think it's Lou jumps in the pool to chase her down and keeps bobbing in and out of the water and is like why am i doing this raw why am i raw <laughs> like it just like i found that highly amusing and it they put a lot of faith into trash bags and those trash bags held up quite a bit really well until he yeah. until he took them off he never once sprung a leak i would have thought that would be a if, if he's gonna get wet anyway i think it would make sense for it to happen by misadventure i really liked that uh, that little moment where he felt the trickle of sweat down his neck and yeah that was good a bit of a bit of rain had gotten in that was good like i really felt like oh shit you know is he really gonna like have trevor go bat shit at this point and of course he had his plastic bags under his pants so he had to take off his pants and the two women of his harem helped dress his legs up and accidentally touched his junk <laughs> of course yeah. There's, there's no good reason to have to put them on under your pants. Come on. <laughs> it's science, guys. <laughs> oh, it's it's not really good, bad, or ugly, but it made me roll my eyes. It's it's kind of a standard, she's not like the other girls. <laughs> She'd led a peaceful, sheltered life, and there was no reason in the world for her to understand. But she did. John could tell. She knew this wasn't pretend. Knew that lives had been lost, that he had killed people whose only crime was getting caught in the black rain, and that he hated all this man pain, man pain. <laughs> it just really made me roll my eyes. <laughs> oh, also the, the, the man that attacked Lou, the naked man, he had mm -hmm. a pipe, piping voice for some reason. Do you think that's supposed to be an indicator that he's gay? Is I that... do. Mm. Oh, here's another eye roll. She clamped the shaft between her legs, fingered to the draperies. Like, she's talking about a, a spear, right? She clamped the shaft between her legs. <laughs> or her skin crawled as if a basket full of spiders had been dumped on her head. John and his women. I just highlighted just that phrase. So let's ask the question, Skix. Would you recommend this to someone? Nope. No? <laughs> Not even a little. <laughs> I probably wouldn't recommend this one unless somebody specifically said, like, Hey, I like books where everybody goes crazy. Do you know any? And I would recommend this and uh, Blood Crazy by uh, Simon Clark and probably a few others if I can think of them. But I would definitely recommend uh, The Midnight Tour by Lehman. It's a part three in a trilogy, but I don't think you need the first two because the, the, essentially the entire book is talking about what happened in the first two. For me, I definitely like this, but I feel guilty about it. <laughs> I don't and I don't. <laughs> Feedback, comments, questions... Submissions, uh, feel free to send them in to dreadperioddialectic at gmail.com. Feel free to call me an SJW cuck anytime. <laughs> that, that was the original title for this podcast was <laughs> SJW cucks. Until next time, for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Skixmatics. And we are...